Scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. Tonight's story, Joe Graham, Story One. Hello there. You know Grays Harbor has a lot of folks who you could call old timers, friends and neighbors who have lived around us so long that they become part of the landscape. You could visit the bank of names as long as your arm of people who are eligible for the title old timers. And they have always been old timers. When the cities of Aberdeen, Hopewim, and Cosmopolis were just becoming clusters of huts along the tidewaters, William O'Leary, Frank Peterson, were old-timers. Everything is relative, and especially time. Forty years of residence here used to qualify a man as old-timer when I was a kid. Not anymore. You've got that forty, but it doesn't amount too much as an old-timer here anymore. Now an old-timer is one who has come here before the towns of, ha of the harbor became incorporated cities. That means 60 years, at least in Aberdeen, and nearly as much for the other towns. Well, all of this is leading up to tonight's story, one of the first of several that we'll find in the hometown scrapbook about the same man, a fellow that most of you will recall for he was one of the real old-timers. His home was in Aberdeen, but he was just about as well-known in Hoquim and Cosmopolis as he was on Heron Street. His name? Why, it's Joe Graham, one-time Aberdeen town marshal, and for years the harbor's yarn spinner, because he had the kind of mind that snagged onto a story and never let it slip away. Joe's been gone quite a few years now, but before he died, he left a storehouse of early Grays Harbor stories that a man who had the storyteller flair and knew how and what a good story was about and how to put it down on paper, that man was Ed Van Sickle. Some of the stories and the recollections of Joe Graham I got from Joe myself back in 1934 when I was doing a short series of radio scripts, and some are from Van Sickle's writings, but all came originally from that grand old-timer Joe Graham, whose stories we're going to start tonight. But first, as usual, we'll have a few words from Dick and our sponsors. Well, it was on a Sunday. Sunday, June 8, 1884, the steamer Governor Newell was thrashing its way up the harbor from Peterson's Point. Captain Jim Whitcomb leaned from the pilot house to enjoy the warm sun and study the heavy green of the spruce line shore. One of his passengers inquired about the swift-winged waterfowl that took off across the harbor on the chalk line course. It's a, snag, a shag, Mr. West, the skipper informed him. We call them Montesano geese. Only the throb of the ship's engine and the thrash of her stern paddles broke the great stillness that stretched away in all directions. A.J. West looked long into the silence of the tree-lined hills. He was a lumberman with a sharp eye for timber. He looked good, and the timber looked good to him. The truth was it looked even better than that. He had never seen such a stand of trees in his life, nor had any other man who hadn't looked on this scene. It was a virgin Douglas fir rainforest, the richest timber storehouse on the face of the earth. He feasted his eyes on hill after hill, and there was a beauty and a wonder of it, spread as if it was at the feet of the snow-capped Olympics clustering ruggedly to the north. Besides the captain, his wife cuddled their seven-week-old infant in the arms while the warm sun supplied a bright glow. 
There were others on the steamer. There was the crew. Uncle Tom Corlett, once a sailor, once a slave driver down south, now a drifter who could fit in anywhere in the New West. Ed McNamee, who blew where in where he belonged with the machinery. And there was W.H. McLeod, the engineer. And there were other passengers, 12 of them all told, and it was a rare day indeed that the Governor Newell came up from Peterson's Point with a dozen new faces aboard. Mrs. John Lewis clutched the hand of her young son George and wondered where she should find her husband John, who had come on ahead. John Young and his wife Ellen were travel weary and hoped that the day would end with them finding a home after their long journey. Then. There were the three young men who stood in the bow, hardly speaking, braced against the ship's breeze, looking hard at every hill and inlet, as they saw for the first time what would someday become familiar as home. They were Arnold West, the Army Captain's 19-year-old son, E.B. Warner, and Joe Graham. They had talked and joked as they left Peterson's Point for Up Harbor. It was to be the last lap of their long trip from Erdmore up in the Michigan timber country. But as the Governor Newell plowed up harbor, they were awed by the sight. There was the greatest to this new land that they had ever dreamed of. In the sunlight of that Sunday morning, it was breathtaking. Off the mouth of the Nushka, Captain Whitcomb swung his little ship confidently around the tip of the island that would someday be called Rennie's and head into the North Channel. It was nearly noon now. We'll soon see Hoquiam, he prophesied in a few minutes. Fingers were pointing out a huddle of whitewashed houses in a clearing. Near it stood a mill, its dock docked deep in fresh cut timber, tied up and loading was a three-masted schooner, the Portland. Upstream, a shipping wharf jutted out from the spruce-lined bank. It was crowded. Joe Graham estimated that half of Hoquiam's population was there, about equally divided between whites and Chinese. The oriental picturesque with their pigtails dangling down over their plain jackets, the whites crowding forward in eagerness. For it was a rare day indeed when the Governor Newell brought in twelve strange faces. While the crew restocked the steamer's fuel, stacking the wood on each side of the engine room door, Joe Graham stepped ashore and saw Hoquiam. He could take it in in a glance. There were a scattering of houses standing on cedar posts raised above the flats that were often flooded in winter. Across the river stood the Campbell House, lonely under the frowning bluff, and there were a few boardwalks, a cow grazing on the river bank, a store building near the wharf, A.M. Simpson's new mill that George Emerson had built and was managing. That was Hoquiam. Joe thought back a piece. Twelve days ago he had left Michigan. It was a long way to travel in less than two weeks. There had been the train trip across the plains, and down the Columbia Gorge, the portage at El Waco, and the steamer trip to North Cove, the stagecoach to Peterson Point, then the steamer trip up the harbor. In 12 days, he had come from civilized timber country to the last fringe on the hem of the west. And there was what passed for civilization, a settlement of whitewashed huts and a store, 17 white men and 13 Chinese, a patch of swamp grass, and a stand of scraggly spruce. It was a long way to come for a sight like this. Joe measured some of his latest steps. The day before, which had been his third out of Portland, he had shaken hands with Tom Rooney at North Cove. That was the Tom Rooney who years later, in 1902, was to start a hitch as sheriff of Pacific County. But when Joe shook his hand, he was a partner in the new North Cove Hotel with an enterprising 
Asian man. <coughs> they had one of the few stops on the ocean skirting trip from Portland up the coast. Joe recalled then, and years later, the fragrant, uncustomed smell that had wafted up from the kitchen at the little hostelry. It had been explained at mealtime when Ronnie had poked his plate of fried clams in front of him, the first Joe had ever eaten. It was also the day Joe had met Frank Peterson, a 28-year-old man who was already a pioneer and who had known the gray dunes almost all of his short life. Frank had met the boat in his buckboard wagon. As the passengers came ashore, he unlimbered his long legs and climbed down to help his with the baggage. The thin bag of mail that was hidden under his seat. Sometimes Frank made room in his buckboard for two or three passengers, but today there were more than he could handle. Ten adults and two children were more than he could make room for in his buckboard. He left Graham and Warner for the next day. That day had been one that Joe would always remember. There he had a long ride to the seashore, the roar of the surf, the feel of fresh salt breeze, the changing panorama of pines and spruce, and then there was the first glimpse of Gray's Harbor. It was a rare excitement for the young man. As the wagon rattled up to Glenn Peterson's place, a house and a barn and the only building in sight on the windswept peninsula, the rest of the travelers were out to meet them. They had spent the night at Peterson's and gathered now for the final lap of the journey. Frank Peterson loaded them in and drove his team belly deep into the clear waters of the bay. The passengers, gay at the thought of the end of their long journey, stepped from the buckboard into the boat and were rowed, rowed across to the steamer laying in the channel, a neat little stern wheeler. She had been named the Washington's territorial governor. In a few minutes, they were making for open waters of the harbor, looking with exploring eyes up the body of water on which they were to make their homes. Now, Dick, a few words for our sponsor, if you please. Yes, Joe Graham, standing on the landing at Hoquiam, thought back a day or two. Things had happened so fast that he had to take a recount at this time to keep his bearings. And now it was time for more of the same. Captain Whitcomb was tooting the whistle, and the travelers were scampering back aboard. The Governor Noel backed and thrashed at the Hoquiam River, then headed for the North Channel, swung wide across Cow Point, and closed in towards shore as the bay narrowed into the river. Now the hills loomed higher, and the tide had covered the mudflats. The passengers crowded to the shore side of the little craft and strained their eyes to the northeast for a sight of a place called Captain West had described, the settlement called Aberdeen. It was exciting, but still there was no break in the shoreline, and not until Captain Whitcomb swung into the mouth of the Wishkaw River did they realize how primitive their new home would be. That this now was Aberdeen. They called the captain's word for it. Six lonesome buildings scattered along the long bank of a strangely named river that wound through a corridor of spruce trees. There was a raw looking clearing with scattered stumps and snags. Then there was bunch grass, driftwood, and brush that clung to the river bank. Yes, Captain West assured them, this is Aberdeen. This mill, he told them, will be built over there. He pointed southwest across the river where some clearing had been started. The piles driving in for a dock stuck starkly up from the water. Yes, this was it, and Joe was ready to take it as it came. He had hoped for more, but he had seen several places with less. He recalled what Captain West had said as they turned into the Wishkaw River. There'll be a real city here in a year or two. Joe was sure he was right in that, but he wished that they had started it a year or two sooner. It was a long way to come to end up with six buildings 
and a handful of scattered homes and a cannery. Yes, that was the Grays Harbor that Joe Graham looked on that day in 1884, and he lived to become an important part of it. And tomorrow night, we'll find more pages in the hometown scrapbook that tell Joe's story. The story of an old timer who saw the harbor grow up from scratch and became an important part of it and of our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening.